So uh, this is called Net Zero Healthcare, Made for You, Medical Assistance in Dying. This is a two-part presentation. So part one is about my grief counseling experience on medical assistance in dying and how I wanted to turn uh, some of that into information for the mental health providers of Alberta. And so I enlisted to do a presentation and I was canceled, <laughs> if you can believe it. And then part two will go into why I think this is not a COVID lockdown, but I think it's a climate lockdown. And you are the carbon footprint that they're trying to reduce. And net zero healthcare is a thing. And sadly, it means made for you. So that might sound quite outrageous. I'm very happy to take any kind of comments after. But let's see what I found. So in 2017, my brother Glenn chose MAID, Medical Assistance in Dying. This is a picture of him when he was quite young. He used to play in bands all over central Alberta in halls like this. This was Buckstone County. Um, I was with him through the whole process and I found it very troubling. I found it really hard to deal with even though I supported his decision. So after some time of not being able to deal with it, I reached out for help. And as I went to talk with my grief counselor, I realized that I probably would sound crazy. And having grown up in Pinoca, I'm quite sensitive to that. <laughs> so because the first thing they said is, so what do you do for a living? And I said, well, I, I work with Friends of Science Society. And they're like, oh, well, what's that about? And I said, well, we hold a dissenting view on climate change. We don't think that it's a catastrophe and we don't think humans are causing it. And uh, of course, the room was kind of silent for a moment. And then to my good fortune, she said to me, oh, yes, well, I know Professor Ross McKittrick. And I was like, Phew. because he actually holds a dissenting view and she knows that there's a scientifically valid opposing view. And then she said, what else are you interested in? And I said, well, I'm really interested in the tar sands campaign and the room was very silent <laughs> because at that time it was considered to be a total conspiracy theory. So uh, fortunately, uh, she was a very helpful person and I started moving along in my grief management. But I realized, wow, if I, who uh, know quite a bit about the Tar Sands campaign, am treated like this by a, psycho by a psychologist, what happens to someone who worked in the oil sands, lost their job, maybe they're a geologist or a geophysicist, and they go to a counselor like this, who doesn't know Ross McKittrick, and when that person says, well, you know, the tar sands campaign about climate change in the oil sands destroyed my job, caused me to get a divorce, ruined my finances, and uh, you know, has almost sent me into despair, or perhaps people in my business or family committed suicide. Um, just imagine that your counselor doesn't believe you because they think you're a conspiracy theorist. So anyhow, there was an opportunity to join into the Canadian Mental Health um, Conference called Working Stronger. And I thought, well, this is an ideal opportunity to help educate some of the people in Alberta who are in the helping community about the Tar Sands campaign and about job loss. Now, years ago, I used to be the employment counselor in Pinoca, and uh, one of the things that we know very well is that unemployment is deadly. It literally kills people. It kills their spirit. It makes them feel ostracized, and uh, psychologist uh, Kipling D. Williams has written a number of books and papers on being ostracized and rejected, and, this is all connected with being um, out of work uh, because in a working society, when you're out of work, you're kind of a nobody. You know, what do you do for a living? Well, you know, nothing. So, and the unemployment, the unemployed suffer from also a lack of purpose, exclusion from larger society and relative social isolation. And this is from a study that Marie Yehoda did in the 1930s in a community in Austria called uh, Marienthal, where the entire town was put out of work overnight when they shut down the local industry. So we've known this for a long, long time. 
And you can notice that many of these characteristics match very well with lockdown. So the foreign funded tar sands campaign is decimating Alberta's workforce and it's doing so through despair, public denigration and demoralization. And uh, there's some statistics here on the oil sands forecast from 2009. They forecast uh, 75,000 jobs in 2010 and a growth to almost a million jobs in 2035. The generation of $2.1 trillion in economic stimulus. The development contributing $105 billion to provincial taxes and over $311 billion in federal taxes. And so um, what happened? And you can see on the graph, um, the tar sands campaign peaked in about 2014, that's when Greenpeace had actually set a goal to drive investors out of the Alberta oil sands. They drove banks off, they sent letters to corporate CEOs telling them that they would be jailed for investing in the oil sands. They, um, of course, hung from the Calgary Tower and got publicity around the world. But you can see that the peak of oil sands investment and the decline also matches up, sadly, with many suicides. And uh, the things I'm showing you right now are parts of my presentation that was cancelled by the CMHA. So, uh, you know, it's very disconcerting for people who work in the oil and gas industry who know that this is a product that's in demand worldwide. This is a product, as we've seen in the past few cold days, we could not survive without it. Um, so to have people say, well, no, no, we're going to get rid of oil and gas. We're all going to run on wind and solar, and you guys are going to have to get another job somewhere. You know, it's very disconcerting to be told that when you know the facts are not so. And in fact, Canada is one of the top 10 um, oil producers in the world. None of these other countries are going to stop producing oil. That's ridiculous. So it's obviously a green trade war against Canada. And here's one of the guys behind it. This guy is named Michael Marx from Corporate Ethics out of the States. According to their website, he coordinated over a hundred international groups to destroy the reputation of the Alberta oil sands and also to destroy Alberta's reputation in general. So this is the Rethink Alberta campaign that he came up with. He ran all these billboards in the States with ducks dripping with oil and the mountains dripping with oil, telling people not even to come here for holidays, let alone invest. Now, a recent analysis by Robert Lyman, who was a federal public servant for um, 27 years, he was a diplomat for 10 years. At present market value, Canada's resource riches are worth 21 trillion US dollars gross value. And most of that money is in Alberta's resources, most of it in the oil sands. 21 trillion US dollars gross value. So how much is that? Well, you could spend a million dollars a day, it would take over 35,600 years to spend 13 trillion. So 13 trillion is the Canadian value. With 13 trillion, you could pay off Canada's entire national debt 13 times. With 13 trillion, you could give $1,733 to every person on the planet, or you could just give every Canadian 342 thousand dollars. We could just share it with Albertans. That's it. Yeah, we could all be trillionaires a few times over. So how does that tie into MADE? Well, there's a connection here with climate uh, so, and money. So the first three requirements for modern medicine are skilled professionals, high quality equipment and supplies, reliable and affordable electricity, and money. Lots of money. Life expectancy is high in Alberta, as you can see from the one graph there. Um, but that creates a problem of its own. Now, the colorful graph is from Alberta Health Services from 2006, but the numbers haven't changed that much. 
But what you can see is that the older people get, the more kind of health conditions they get. And so, in other words, they get more expensive to the system. Healthcare is the province's single largest expense. And uh, in 2019, the province is, in, is increasing the health care budget by 200 million, bringing the overall operating spending to $20.6 billion a year. In Alberta, um, in Alberta alone. So it's the largest chunk of the provincial budget. And you may have seen recently, they've published sort of sunshine lists and a lot of the money being spent is in administration. A, a few years ago, I think it was four or five years ago, they revealed that there are 32 vice presidents at AHS. Maybe they need them all, I kind of doubt it. But my concern, being somebody who does a lot on climate, is that the medical community globally is now conflating climate and health care. And this, I think, is a very dangerous path. So this headline says, the climate crisis and cancer, the need for urgent access. And why is that a problem? Because Michael Creighton wrote about politicized science and why it's dangerous. Some people may remember there used to be eugenics laws in, in Alberta even, right up until 1972. There were eugenics laws in Alberta that allowed the Alberta government to detain people and sterilize them against their will, without their consent. Um, but in Germany, it was much worse. And many people don't know this. Before the Holocaust, Germany would take useless eaters, people who they felt were a burden on the system, a financial economic burden, pick them up in a little van, take them to a medical institute where they would be um, examined and sent to a room and gassed with carbon monoxide. This was a way of reducing the expenses of the government of the day. And this went on from the 1900s to 1945. And in fact, Crichton writes how the American eugenicists were jealous of how good the Germans were taking care of this economic problem and these people who they felt were useless eaters. I hate to say it that way, but these are the words from that time. And so sadly, the way I see it now is that you are a carbon footprint to climate activists and increasingly so to health providers. In September of 2019, the exponential roadmap was issued by some influential climate activists and they wanted to cut emissions in half by 2030, which is virtually impossible to do. By November, the UNEP, the UN Environment Program, was issuing statements that we need to cut global emissions by 7.6% every year for the next decade to meet the Paris targets. And then you can see this other item, healthcare's response to climate change, a carbon footprint assessment of the NHS in England. Now, it's important to recognize that as part of the climate change movement, there is a deeply embedded depopulation theme. And at Davos in 2020, Jane Goodall, you know, the uh, gorilla in the mist lady, she said that all these environmental things we talk about wouldn't be a problem if there was just the size of population that there was 500 years ago. The world population then was estimated between 420 and 540 million. So that's 6.7 billion fewer people than today. And in 2018, we at Friends of Science noted that, wow, The Lancet was publishing an article about climate change and how governments should be setting a price on carbon, investing in renewables, and all these ridiculous things. I mean, why would a health uh, Lancet publication is that big healthcare publication in the world. Why would that community be advocating for wind and solar? You can't do heart surgery on wind and solar because it's a variable electricity. It could drop off right in the middle of surgery. Like, these are crazy ideas. And, you know, what about improving sanitation in poor countries around the world? So, I did this video for Friends of Science. You can see it, it's online. <laughs> 
And then recently I saw a webinar where a woman named Jody Sherman, who's with Yale um, University in the States in public health sector, uh, she and her colleagues wrote this net zero health care, a call for clinician action. In this document, she says health care contributes 5% of the world's GHG emissions, and she thinks that can easily be cut in half by 2030 because of our response to COVID, because we were so capable and so able to pivot in response to COVID, it should be easy to cut health care emissions. Well, you know, healthcare is filled with all kinds of emissions. There's plastics, there's the energy that runs all the pumps in the building. You gotta have negative airflow out of the surgical wards, all the lighting and surgery, all the high-tech equipment. Like, this is not something that you go, well, let's just unplug the heart pump because uh, we'll keep the, uh, the rest of the operation going. You can't pick and choose that way. So the other thing that's happened as we discussed with uh, Colonel Redmond, is that lockdowns and isolation increase depression. And what happened in the fall of 2020 is that facing another retirement home lockdown, this 90-year-old woman chose medical assistance in dying. And her family supported it. She was very healthy, and according to this story, in the first lockdown, she kept quite busy in her little room. She was exercising, doing sit-ups from her chair and stuff like that. But when the second lockdown came around, she just said, no, I'm not doing that again. So she chose medical assistance in dying, which up until that time had been very limited to people who were at imminent risk of death and suffering along the way. And in uh, 2020, the public, uh, the, uh, what's it called, the uh, PBO? Parliamentary, pa budget. Parliamentary budget, o budget Office put out this report showing that the test run on, bill, on uh, medical assistance in dying had saved lots of money for the healthcare system. Like rather than being old and having all those chronic diseases I showed you, well, why not just pop people off and it's just, a cost saving. They go on to say in the report, well, we don't mean that as like, we should do something like that. But guess what? This is how Canada kills people. They make them lonely and then they give them made. This is in the, the conservative woman in uh, the UK. So this is my brother and he did choose made and I do support his choice. And he granted me permission to talk about this before he died. Um, he was a retired chiropractor and he started falling down a lot. He started being very stiff in his movements and we thought maybe he'd had a stroke, maybe Alzheimer's, we didn't know what. But it turned out that he had a progressive supranuclear palsy, which is a very aggressive cousin of Parkinson's. And uh, it got to the point where he, who used to be a marathon runner in the top five in British Columbia, could not walk down the street without looking like he was a drunk. Got thrown out of stores because he was walking with this falling gait. He couldn't explain himself because his speech was so slurred, they thought that he was a drunk. His life was humiliating and he wanted out. And the next stage for him would have been a wheelchair and a feeding tube, and he did not want that. But the process of MAID at that time was very difficult to get, unlike what it is now. At that time, Alberta Health Services tried everything they could to help my brother to live and to live the best way that he could. He had detailed medical diagnosis, he had MRIs, and PET scans, blood work, excellent care by the neurosurgeons at the Foothills Medical Center. He had weeks of rehab care at the Sheldon Schumer Center in Calgary. He had consultation with social workers, occupational therapists, and psychologists. And he had a thorough review by all the doctors and social workers. They did everything they could to help him live. But I don't think anyone considering MAID from now on will get that kind of consideration. I don't think anyone, like all these people, they kind of stood in the doorway and said, let's make sure about your condition before you cross that irrevocable line. 
let's make sure no one's pushing you, whether they're accidentally pushing you by saying, gee, you know, it's really hard having you around, or whether they're actually pushing you and say, wouldn't you feel better not being around? Doesn't it hurt all the time? Like there are some people who have very serious conditions, but somehow they find a way to be joyful with what they have and they want to live on. But we have now created a situation where I don't think that that will happen. And now we're broke. So now you can see why there, you know, when you have an elder locked down in an elder care facility who doesn't want to be locked down again, well, the doctor can pop by on Thursday. You know, it might be just like booking jazzercise. There's jazzercise on Tuesday and made if you want on Thursday. I mean, perhaps that's an exaggeration, but I think we're on the slippery slope. So, and to confirm what I'm saying, uh, Deloitte just issued a report with the Canadian Men Medical Association. It just came out in November. And it's funny, they call this a struggling system because they're talking about the medical system, but it's actually the people who are struggling. Because if you look at the statistics, there are 60,000 um, uh, in-house assessments that were not done. There are 4,000 excess deaths that are not related to COVID. There are uh, between 68 and 94 percent of people did not get in-person care from their doctor for chronic uh, conditions. 70 percent increase in opioid deaths. 27% increase in anxiety, 39% um, increase in, I can't read that, uh, food insecurity, food insecurity. And uh, 20 to 35% of missed cancer screenings. These people have all been sentenced to MAID. They have been given medical assistance in dying by being denied care through lockdowns and many of them will probably be in pain, and they're out after being on an ever-lengthening waiting list, will only be made. It will be difficult for their families to support them because people are already broke. So I think that the confluence of net zero health care and net zero climate is a life-threatening trend. And to wrap this around again, the economic devastation of the tar sands campaign for Albertans and for Canadians means that our health care choices will face significant limitations and the proper development and trade in our resource riches would provide the necessary finances for thoughtful health care and not made for you. Thank you. <laughs>